Good morning guys, welcome to the That Day in the Sky podcast series. Today we'll be discussing a topic from oral pathology which is going to be lichen planus. Uh, so immediately when you hear the word lichen planus, what comes to your mind is a predominantly white lesion that is having uh, manifestations in the oral cavity as well as on the skin. Uh, so oral lichen planus is a very common mucocutaneous disease. And uh, as you go through your Schaefer's, which you can with me, um, it was first described by Wilson in 1869. Uh, it's good to know who gave it. And then uh, the most important part about lichen planus is its bilateral white striated appearance and uh, its ability to appear as papules or plaques. And it's predominantly seen on the buccal mucosa, tongue and gingiva. So it is also characterized by certain forms, some of which show erythema, erosions and blisters. Um, the involvement of the oral mucous membrane is uh, pretty frequent and uh, uh, it precedes the appearance of the lesion on the skin. So in terms of your answers, epidemiology is uh, um, a one-liner that you can add. Like for example, things like the risk for oral lichen planus is highest among those who smoke and chew tobacco up to like 13.7 percent is something that will give a bit of weight to your answer uh, other than that the etiology of lichen planus is that it is a t-cell mediated autoimmune disease so explaining a little further about this etiology would be helpful and this would also help you to differentiate between lichenoid drug reaction which is similar to lichen planus in so many clinical features and histological features but uh, when you go in depth you realize that the etiology is what is different uh, lichenoid drug reactions as the name suggests are because of localized uh, factors um, coming to other important things in it an important syndrome associated with lichen planus is called the Grinspan syndrome which is the association of lichen planus with diabetes mellitus and vascular hypertension. So this could be a viva question. And uh, coming to the clinical features, something that is important is understanding that uh, lichen planus occurs in characteristic forms of 6P. This is an easy way to remember it. It is that it is purple in color usually. It is pruritic or itchy. It is papular. It may appear as plaque or patches and uh, that it is usually polyhedral in shape so this you can note it down somewhere the occurrences is more common in females by a slight bit and it is seen in the 40 years age group uh, they are usually discrete lesions and they have a fine glistening appearance and a scaly uh, surface and uh, they have a reddish purplish or violaceous hue surrounding the lesion as well Sometimes when the lesion gets older, it becomes a dirty brown in color and uh, uh, it has a characteristic feature known as the Wickham stripe, which appears as very fine grayish white lines on the surface of the lesion. This can also be found on the skin surface, um, but it usually it is distributed in a bilateral pattern, which is pretty clinically um, con conclusive to become uh, lichen planus. Something that you can check for on the skin similarly is that uh, this similar appearance is seen on the knees, thighs, trunk, sacral area, wrist, forearms and the flexor surfaces. Um, so that those are the skin manifestations. The face usually remains uninvolved. Coming to the oral manifestation, um, the oral manifestation would appear somewhat like a radiating white or grey velvety thread-like papules in a linear, annular or retiform arrangement forming typical lacy reticular patches, rings and streaks over the buccal mucosa and to a lesser extent on the lips, tongue and palate. Now the textbook part apart, what you have to realize that these are the different forms of lichen planus that can be observed. So it becomes clinically relevant when you are in the diagnostics of dentistry. Other than that, what you can also keep in mind is the occurrence which is pretty important. So 80% of lichen planus is seen in the buccal mucosa. In the tongue it's 65% chance. On the lips it's 20% chance followed by the gingiva, floor of the mouth and the palate which is less than 10% all put together. 
so the patient will have a complaint of a burning sensation so that is pretty characteristic uh, the vesicles and bullae as i previously told would appear as uh, reddish erosive erythematous blisters uh, now there are certain forms of lichen planus uh, some textbooks say there are five some say there are six but uh, knowing uh, these five are more than enough the first thing is the bullous form so the bullous form of lichen planus appears as a enlarged swelling uh, which goes on to change to the next form which is the erosive form of the lichen planus in which these bullae they erode and become sore so these uh, erosive uh, lesions are rather painful and uh, these vesicles when they um, erode they become ulcerated and uh, they have irregular shapes and sizes and they stay as raw and painful areas which doesn't heal very quickly and the next form we'll discuss is the reticular form which characteristically shows the vicam stride and then the fourth form which you need to remember is the atrophic form so the atrophic form as the name suggests would be a somewhat shrunken down appearance similar to the erosive it would be smooth, red, poorly defined and uh, the peripheral stri would also be evident. Um, so now why do you need to concentrate on the atrophic part? Because in perio when you read chronic desquamatous gingivitis, a common etiology for desquamatous gingivitis is uh, this atrophic form of oral lichen planus. So you can link it like that. So this is seen in postmenopausal women, this atrophic lichen planus, which appears as a red, diffuse, painful condition of the gingiva very painful it looks very erosive and uh, the patient does not even let you uh, touch the lesion it's that painful and that much of a psychologically insulting lesion to the patient other than that the other form or the fifth form that you need to remember is the hypertrophic form also known as the plaque type in some textbooks it is a form of lichen planus that occurs in the old mucosa but it is well circumscribed and elevated from the surface and appears as a leukoplakic lesion. It is definitely predominantly white. Consider also that the erosive and the atrophic forms are reddish and the hypertrophic form is the one that appears whitish. Okay. So the other oral manifestations that you need to concentrate on is the differentiation of oral lichen planus from lichenoid lesions. Lichenoid lesions, as I previously told you, are induced by drugs such as sulfonylureases, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, anti-malarials, beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors, and so on and so forth. Also, the other uh, form of lichen planus is the idiopathic lichen planus, for which the etiology obviously cannot be found and uh, lichen planus also has a strong association with the graft versus host disease um, so coming to the general appearance um, of how lichen planus would look as a um, summarization you would see a reticular erythematous erosive lesion or ulcer with whitish streaks similar to that of become stri so this is how it would seem um, coming to the next part which is the histologic uh, findings uh, which are that the histopathologic examination of oral lichen planus is rather necessary because it would help you rule out between other red white lesions. So the first finding that you would see is the hyperparakeratosis or hyperautokeratosis on the most superficial layer of the epithelium. Uh, so what this keratosis literally means is that the keratinocytes which are there they uh, secrete, uh, they undergo this process of keratinization and when there is excessive amount of keratinization that occurs there is a more a keratin dense keratohyalin layer that's formed on the surface so this may either be ortho or para keratinized so that is what they are referring to so what they mean to say is the layers have been thickened because of excessive keratinization so the thickne thickening in this lesion would be in the granular cell layer um, in which acanthosis which is literally the thickening of the granular layer and uh, intracellular edema would occur because there is so much inflammation that the inflammatory fluid just seeps in between the cells and causes the thickening to even uh, um, you know amplify and the other thing is that the retiridges or the uh, involvement of the surface epithelium into the connective tissue they appear 
to be sawtoothed or sharp in nature. This is because it is, as I told before, a T lymphocyte mediated autoimmune reaction. So, on the sites of the retiridges, when the T lymphocytes attack the retiridges, what happens? It starts to taper until it reaches a sawtooth appearance. Then, what else you need to remember is that below all these changes, there is a band of subepithelial um, um, uh, lymphocytic infiltration. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so this band is a ca then another characteristic feature that is found, and within the keratinocytes, what you can also observe is that there are certain um, bodies of colloids, uh, civeti, hyaline, cytoid. These are all the different names. Now, how are these bodies formed? When the keratinocytes are uh, being keratinized, what happens? Some of them degenerate when they are re uh, when they reach from the basal to the surface layers. And as they uh, degenerate, what happens? They clump up together, and when you stain these, they appear as homogeneous eosinophilic globules. So now you know why these happen as well. So now these degenerating uh, basal keratinocytes, what they leave? They leave a gap within the um, epithelium. So it appears like there's a split or a blister within the epithelium, and this appears as a histologic cleft known as the Max Joseph spaces. Okay, so now you know why the Max Joseph uh, spaces also form. I will also explain about uh, um, the desmosome and hemidesmosomes when I give you a general overview of the skin related diseases. But as of now, you understand this much. And coming to the diagnostics of uh, lichen planus, the direct immunofluorescence technique is a technique that you need to know well because that does carry marks for you in the exam. So the immunofluorescence will show a positive uh, uh, finding, uh, especially it will outline the basement membrane zone. And uh, another thing is the complements, uh, the anti-C3 will also be found. It will also be shown very well in the immunofluorescence. And then uh, when you do the electron microscopy, of course, you will find all the uh, features that we discussed before but you'll also find certain breaks branches and duplications of the base membrane in lichen planus so now what are the differential diagnosis for lichenoid reactions um, uh, for lichen planus so they would be lichenoid reaction leukoplakia which is a whitish lesion candidiasis which may be whitish um, or it is like pseudomembranous or it can be an erythematous candidiasis uh, pemphigus similarly is also an erosive, erosive and bullous lesion. The cicatricial pemphigoid is similar to the pemphigus. The erythema multiforme which is a very um, acute and painful lesion. Syphilis which has manifestations of uh, loose on the skin and the oral cavity which we will be discussing later. The recurrent aptus stomatitis or RAS ulcers and the lupus erythematosus which is again an autoimmune disease. Um, Coming to the malignant potential of lichen planus, which is a very important thing you need to remember. What you need to remember is the more pain that it causes to the patient initially, the more pain it is going to cause the patient in the end. So forms like the erosive and atrophic have the highest malignant potential to transform into a squamous cell carcinoma per se. So the chances of that happening is between 0.3 and 3%, but why take the risk at all? Prevent it before it happens, right? So coming to the treatment, the treatment for oral lichen planus is not very definitive. So palliative treatment becomes what we consider uh, very much. Uh, other than that, going to the root of the problems, since it's an autoimmune reaction, corticosteroids would be your best bet. Uh, and other than that, the other important questions that they may ask you, I'll just review those, is first the Grinspan syndrome, the graft versus host disease, the Max Joseph spaces, the Civete cytoid hyaline bodies, the Vicamstri, the sawtooth retiridges, are some of the things that they might ask you for two markers in your viva. I hope this helps and this will be posted often as a podcast, uh, which is close to five to seven minutes. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, podcast. Thank you very much.